welcome to our circular coffee conversation. Um, so this is really a place where we meet every other week with the idea to explore um, different aspects of the circular economy. And at the moment, we're really focusing on the fashion theme. And today, we're actually very lucky to be uh, joined with uh, by um, Josie Warden, um, who is the head of regenerative design at the RSA. Um, and she will basically be um, discussing with Erica for the next 15 or 20 minutes on some very interesting topics. So I'm not going to say too much, otherwise <laughs> I'm going to spoil the conversation there. Uh, but as usual, this conversation are, you know, very friendly and welcoming. So any question that you've got, please log them into the chat. Um, and at the end of the conversation, we're going to have about 10 minutes um, to be able to ask all of them to Josie. So without any further ado, Erica, I'll pass it on to you to have a chat with Josie. Yeah, thanks, Sophie. And yeah, I'm excited to be joined by Josie Borden today, who actually our paths have crossed uh, in the past a few times, so, so we've enjoyed catching up as well. But first of all, Josie, um, we always start by asking our guests um, to have brought a circular conversation starter, um, so a physical object or something that represents what you're doing or working around the circular economy. What have you brought for us today? Hi, thank you so much for inviting me, first of all. Really nice to see you all. And yeah, it's been great to catch up with you, Erica, because as you say, we've like our paths have crossed over the years. Um, I've brought uh, this, which is a tiny totem pole. Actually, I didn't realize it wouldn't wouldn't show up very well on video. Um, and this uh, is really important to me because my on my dad's side, my family are First Nation Canadian. Um, and it's I think a lot of the the kind of um, the worldviews and the um, cultures and ways of working and practices that um, I'm learning about a lot more um, about that side of my family um, are really inspirational in how we kind of can have a very different relationship with the natural world around us and um, the, the kind of cultures and practices enables um, the kind of this is particularly on the uh, west coast of Canada um, to have really um, incredibly long-lasting um, and sustainable relationships with the with ecosystems but in a way that was very um, kind of mutually beneficial and reciprocal with those ecosystems around them so I think that's a really kind of inspirational thing for us to, to learn from at the moment and something that's been uh, obviously over the past uh, centuries really um, oppressed and actually thinking now how we how can we um, sort of uh, learn from that but also um, repair some of those kind of relationship damages that have happened over over the centuries as well so that's something that's really yeah really important to me at the moment. Wow that, that's beautiful I, I really was I wasn't aware of that kind of journey or background actually that that you had as well Do, is there um just just on that the totem pole there is there a particular meaning to that one that you know or have you looked uh, into no, the story? Not that I know <laughs> I think that, this yeah. is I think this is just a it is just a kind of tourist like piece it's from I think it's from like the 70s um but uh it's so this is from Vancouver Islands and so some of my family are from there but others are also from the bank like mainland just around Vancouver so there are obviously lots of different um different nations who have very different kind of very different cultures and artworks and um uh languages etc but this is um but collectively they have very similar sort of similar um perspectives on um the world and how they kind of relate to it um but it's my dad was uh, adopted and moved here in the 70s, yeah, sorry, in the, yeah, in the 70s. So we're, both of us have actually just been learning a lot more and connecting with um, his, like his birth family and finding out more about that. So it's kind of feels like an exploration for me as well, because it wasn't something that was very much part of like my childhood growing up other than knowing broadly that's where he came from. Um, yeah. So it feels like and it's, uh, yeah, an inquiry for me as well at the moment. And I think, I mean, that that's almost that, that beautiful linkage with with now I think um, you've got um, the, the term head of regenerative design for the RSA and I think regenerative is this word uh, particularly in the sustainability sector or, or thinking that that is becoming more and more to the forefront and as you're saying links back actually when you look back into cultures and, and different ways of living um, that were potentially regenerative as well, kind of learning from that in the past. So yeah, that's a, that's a really nice link to the, the first kind of question or area I was going to ask you about is, is your own journey within um, the circular economy, um, sustainability, I know you've got textile 
background um, to, to kind of take you where you are now and, and working also around the fashion perspective. Yeah, yeah. So I originally trained as a textile designer um, and I think what really interested me in that sector and it was specifically for fashion was, was the sense of um, what clothes, I guess, what clothes mean to us to be able to express identities and cultures um, have really tracked kind of industrial changes, particularly in the last you know couple of centuries, um, but are also really um, you know world textiles are so diverse that they really represent the land that different textiles come from, the different kind of uh, plants and materials and dye tech combination of um, learning about materiality and stuff and how you make things, um, and also um, cultural identity and what how we express what we think is important in society um so that's was one of my training um and but i found like the stuff that i was really interested in within that when it kind of came into working in industry felt very different because obviously it's an industry that's really driven by um very uh high targets around sales and volume and you know underpinned by the need to kind of just sell more and more stuff um and all of the kind of richness that uh like me and also a lot of my kind of um, uh, course mates felt about the kind of the actual uh, practice itself is it, we felt we didn't find very very strongly in industry um, and I guess I graduated at a point where um, sustainability was a very niche conversation in fashion and that has changed a lot over the last few years which is great um, but kind of from from that sector um, was looking for who actually is doing really interesting stuff around sustainability and looking at this in a very different way and that was when I first met with Sophie Thomas who was head of great recovery at the RSA um, which was our project on the circular economy and uh, I think that just her framing of like of circular economy and the, the very different conception it has of um, the flow of materials and what we should be aiming for um, was really inspirational and um, really sort of moved me more into that kind of path and, and way of thinking um, and uh, then luckily came to work at the RSA and I guess over the past few years I've been thinking more around how does our work at the RSA we do a lot of work around um, social inequality and social justice as well and feeling like a lot of the conversations about circular economy sort of have a nod towards the, the kind of human impacts and the um, the need for kind of just transition and um, distributing value more widely etc but actually that conversation felt like it is not as full as it could be within circular economy and that's where again I guess the thinking around um, regenerative design and this approach of actually looking very much at um, everything as being interconnected really recognizing the kind of nestedness of our system so things like donor economics of like humans sitting within um, the wider environment um, and the need to work with more uh, kind of context appropriate solutions and like how do you make it in the way that maybe previously textile you know it, uh, global textiles have developed like you had clothing that was really suited to that place because it came off it was from the lands from those materials and fibers it was mm. suited to the environment etc how can we learn from that way of thinking when it comes to circular economy and kind of embedding those really context I don't know, has it frozen for anyone else? Yeah. <laughs> Tracy, you've frozen. Um, an element of circular design might, circular design might look like, um, which is what we're kind of starting to explore at the RSA more now, and which is really, really fun. <laughs> cool. You, you froze for just like a little bit at the end there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but I think um, you've got to this stage now within the RSA that there are programmes now focusing on the um, fashion and circular economy and, and bringing in regenerative um, design thinking around that as well. Could you um, tell us a bit about, I think, is it the one with the Ellen McCarth Foundation that's recently yeah. happened and, and some of the other linkages that I know, I think there has got a living change approach and, and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so we've been partnering with the Ellen McCarthy Foundation on their, they've got that very big Make Fashion Circular programme. Um, and obviously their focus is, they have the fantastic connections with big industry um, and 
um, their kind of focus there has been supporting the kind of brands and, and organizations they work with to, to, to transition more towards circular economy um, and, and understand what circular design might or design for circular economy might look like within fashion. Um, and so we partnered with them particularly to look at um, the kind of smaller scale side of things. So to work with um, firstly the kind of next generation of designers. So RSA runs a big student design award competition and we ran a couple of briefs um, around circular fashion, um, which was engaging not just fashion students, but students across all kinds of design disciplines to help them think about how they could apply their skills to learn about circular economy and to apply it to, to the fashion sector. Um, and then the other thing we've been doing is supporting designers that are, um, and kind of creatives that are more at the kind of niche layer of the system. So whilst Ellen MacArthur are working with, you know, uh, H&M and uh, Adidas and the kind of the large scale size, actually, how do you also start from the kind of small scale organisations that are being disruptive and bringing new ideas and, and kind of start to create the dialogue between the two groups? Um, so we ran a programme called Rethink Fashion, which was for 12 um, participants who were all working at this sort of in innovation niche, niche level, um, but from very different parts of the fashion system and slightly kind of outside fashion as well. So we had people from marketing, from material development, um, from um, uh, designers themselves, through to uh, people who are looking more at the kind of uh, manufacturing side of things. So we had a, a kind of mix of people from across that sector. And the idea was to bring them together to help them to think about how they could increase their, intentionally increase their impact in kind of this acceleration towards circular economy, both as individuals, but also as a kind of collective, a collective and a field of practice, because they're often operating very much in isolation. Um, and we felt like they need to, you know, they need some opportunities to join the dots kind of sideways and learn from each other um, and think about how they could be more intentional about that kind of collective push that they're putting like further up the system. Um, so that was, a, that was an amazing opportunity to, to kind of do that and then to connect them as well with the um, kind of network of RSA, but also with the network of Alan MacArthur Foundation and sort of share some of those, those learnings. Um, and to do it in a very kind of, you know, collaborative way, quite different from an accelerated way, you're generally focused on your own mission and scaling that, that often scaling a kind of product or a, um, uh, a service. This was more about how do you scale the idea of circular economy and the kind of practice of design? How do you kind of work together to, to increase that and, and share that with more people? Yeah, that, that's, it almost links back to, to when we, um, we met actually, when I was doing some of the open source circular economy stuff and the role of more open, collaborative and transparent design you know, together rather than a traditional competitive industry. Yeah. We almost have to, to move it forward um, together in a way. Um, from I was working with some, some smaller, interesting, uh, emerging kind of startups or, or businesses to the, to the maybe the larger corporate uh, giant <laughs> fashion producers. Where are you seeing or what type of really interesting um, projects or, or ideas are you seeing emerging or um, you know, things, things happening in, in moving towards more regenerative yeah. and circular fashion? I think it's really interesting, even in the last, so we started to sort of, I mean, regenerative, the kind of idea of regenerative and the word regenerative has been used by people for a long, long time. And there's a lot of people who are very like deep in that practice. Um, and it connects lots of work around kind of permaculture and built environment and regenerative farming. Um, but we've noticed even in the last, I think the last six months really, that in fashion, this word, the word regenerative is being used so much more um, and it's interesting to see like how it feels like that there is a sort of desire to have this new way of thinking about things or, or to build on on the way that they're thinking about things around moving from sort of doing less harm to kind of trying to give back but actually it's it's I think we're slightly it's interesting to see how quickly it's being taken up because in some ways it feels like it's quite it's still quite a superficial look at it um, so we are seeing brands talking about, rather than saying recycled uh, plastic, they're saying regenerated fibres to make it, it feels like it's a marketing, a marketing push rather than something that's much deeper. On the other hand, there are lots of really interesting initiatives um, that are looking much more, I guess, coming from the regenerative agriculture and fibre side of things, of like how can you work, how can you look at um, the connection with land and building kind of communities of value, et cetera, through doing that. So it's, so it's interesting to see 
um, organizations like um, Caring, who own lots of luxury brands, kind of investing a lot in uh, in regenerative agriculture um, practices, just trying to support that and understand what that might look like. So it's a, at the moment, it feels like it's uh, the fashion industry are really excited by this idea. Um, the one on one hand, it might go down quite a shallow route of like it basically becomes a word that we switch out for something and without actually <clears throat> addressing underlying stuff. Um, but then it is, it is also potential for it to, to kind of go down the other route and look more more deeply. Um, and so I think the, the organisations like uh, Fiber Shed, which exist around the world, who are looking at the kind of actually what how could we create a local fibre shed, like a watershed of like the, the practices that happen at, at a land based level to create fibres, um, are really exciting and really innovative practices that even though they're built on very traditional practices, they're kind of applying it in a, into the kind of existing fashion system. So I think that's where some really interesting things are coming coming from. Yeah, and I think there's that almost some of those elements is 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 sort of circling back to what what potentially we work like. I see this I suppose a lot of the sustainability circus it's kind of circling back to how things were done yeah. in the past, but recognizing a global connected tech world we live in and, and what does that look like um, now as well. Just um, within before I pass over to Sophie to to had a few questions um, in the chat as well. But one question that we also always ask, yes, is if uh, we could get someone on uh, on here that would be interesting to, to chat to either about fashion or, or you know if we're going to actually some of the next things we're going to look at is around regener regenerative practices and well-being <laughs> and experiences um, as well as tech in the in the future. So if there's someone that you think or, or a topic that would be interesting for us to to kind of look at in our in our sector economy chat, um, yeah, do you have an idea? I think I just mentioned fiber sheds, and I think they uh, they're doing really interesting interesting work. So in the there's, in the UK, there's I think there's three now, um, uh, and they're basically looking at uh, say in an area of the UK, how could we how can we join up the kind of um, regenerative farming and fiber practices that are happening, but also how can we look at the what infrastructure is needed to scale this? So obviously, you're probably aware that the UK produces like for example a huge amount of wool that isn't being used well so how can we like look at the infrastructure that could support that and also how can we look at fibres that we maybe are not producing now but did in the past like flax and um, hemp um, so I would recommend either Emma Haig from um, Fibre Shed Southwest um, or potentially one of the farmers um, and designers that they work with um, or um, Deborah Baker from Fibre Shed Southeast around um, Ooh, their kind of practices. <laughs> <laughs> and just actually connected to that, just before we came on, you said that um, the RSA, they've released a report around plastic. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we've today. Been, <laughs> yeah, we've been yeah. doing some work around looking at um, plastics within fashion and kind of the, because it's a very contentious issue, partly around obviously plastic, plastics enable fi um, fabrics and garments to do very different things. So that's like so tech where, for example, it adds stretch, it has waterproofness, as durability, um, but also it's obviously part of the, um, it's a finite resource, it's part of the petrochemical industry, and it's part of the kind of business model that also shores up the existing oil and gas sectors, which we know need to be radically uh, wound down. Um, so thinking about actually when it comes to fashion, what, what, how are we using plastic and how are we using it appropriately? Um, so we've so there's some research that we've done that's coming out today slash it might be might be tomorrow that it's actually out the press release about today but around um the use of looking at fast fashion um uh, so it's at four big brands and looked at what um fiber contents um are in there like ten thousand of their recently added garments and seeing that um 88 of them contain uh virgin polyester or virgin other um, kind of petrochemical derived fibres um, and sometimes it's up to 60-70% of their whole range is entirely made of that. Um, so whilst they're still starting to talk about the idea of using recycled uh, uh, synthetics, actually in practice it's mainly new, uh, new, uh, new synthetic fibres which are um, you know still kind of building up the, this mountain of waste that we have and they're really garments that are not designed the fact that they're durable is not really that helpful because they're not designed to last beyond the season because of the styling that they're created with etc so trying to create that conversation around and actually 
consumers not necessarily being aware of the volume that is that is in these um that is in garments so yeah so hopefully there might be some stuff out tomorrow so keep an eye out oh, cool no that sounds that sounds really interesting i think it also links a bit to that kind of uh, you know the green washing regenerative sustainable washing yeah. thing that, that happens in a lot of industries where the reality of, of the huge amount of what's still happening compared to the maybe the tiny bit that they they market or talk yeah. about but oh uh Josie, we could go on for like hours probably <laughs> in detail and it's such a big big topic and you've got so much knowledge uh in the area and, and, and co-designing and evolving it as well I, I know that you're very keen on that but I'm going to pass over to Sophie because I've seen a, a flurry of um questions pop up in the chat uh, to, to ask you about thank you sure thank you I was so inspired. I was like, oh, listening to you. I was like, oh my goodness. Patient, <laughs> new fibers. There's just so much in what you say. So thank you so much for that to start with. So yeah, just picking up um, a few of the questions that we've got. So we've got Rob who was asking, what should I look when I buy a new shirt? And I think that's an interesting question in the sense that, you know, us as consumers, you yeah. don't know basically. So I'd love to get your view really on this one and, and around the information. Yeah, it's really difficult, I think, to know, because so, as you say, there are so many aspects to it. I guess, I think the, the first question is like, do you need dip? <laughs> um, have you got something that would be as good that could be repaired or uh, mended, etc.? So I think that's the, that's the main one. Or, and then um, if, it, if it's a new garment rather than something that could be bought secondhand, um, I think it's, it, it depends on individuals, but really looking at durability something that you think is going to last you for a long time and that is going to be um that's going to be that's been well made so that the you feel like the seams are strong that the um that the kind of uh fittings like buttons etc are well made um and that will be able to be cared for easily um i think because i think it's that the the big challenge is buying more than we need to and i think we all do that um but also then thinking about actually trying to have things that last for a long time um, and then looking at ways that that can be repaired or cared for well whether that's through you doing things yourselves or whether you can find people locally who can repair things um, so I think that's the the main things to kind of look for. Yeah, thank you we, we had someone else explain, I think the most sustainable garment is the one in your wardrobe today <laughs> that's exactly what you're saying um, we also have a question from Iran um, when you know you were mentioning the fact that um, sustainable fashion now is becoming more less niche and more mainstream but it's the same with greenwashing so she was wondering really what's your thinking and your view around the greenwashing in the sustainability in the sustainable fashion industry yeah I think I think it, it, it's come on it has come on a long way it was very Basically, people were just really not interested in it a few years ago, and now brands know that they need to do it. And I think the uh, like people who are working in the industry <clears throat> know more about it than they did before. But I think the challenge with the, the challenge with fashion, which is obviously true for other industries too, but feels very acute in fashion, is just that the model is still based on selling more. Um, and until I think brands start really looking at their business models, if the brand is not starting to look at that in any way, then I think. Um, it's going to stay at that kind of level of, of greenwashing, really. Um, but if they're starting to think about actually how do we, um, as a business model, I guess it's also things like different ways of getting revenue. Are we thinking about how we could offer kind of resale or repair um, or, or, or connect to brands or other businesses that are doing that? Um, or potentially looking at um, the way that they're, the way they're engaging with their workers as well and starting to bring those two, the kind of social and the environmental as mental aspects together, I think are really important. Um, so I think for big, I mean, for really big uh, brands, it is a massive challenge for them because everything they're built on is around this kind of scaling and, and selling more. Um, so it's, it, so I think it's good that we're seeing the kind of moves from, from the big high street brands. But I think really the, the really innovative stuff and the, the, the practices that are going to kind of take over are probably coming from the sort of smaller scale and startup areas, again, who are able to build businesses based on very different models. So people who are doing rental, um, who are looking at um, kind of smaller capsule collections, but which are uh, longer lasting and able to be repaired, et cetera, um, I think are really important. So I guess when people are looking at where they're spending money, looking at where possible, trying to support people who are, they think are really committed to doing something differently. Um, and because that I think does help send the message to the bigger brands who are 
um, you know, have a big mountain to climb to really change their models that they're that they're producing. Um, and then it's about I think for consumers to sort of think how they how how um, yeah how com confident or comfortable they feel with those different brands because um, I think that, that depends very much on people's different different perspectives as well. I know what you're saying here as well that the smaller brands can be the one challenging and innovating more. I've seen the research recently actually saying that consumers also trust more the smaller brands basically yeah. more with the, and help them to become more sustainable ultimately through the different products that they are offering there. Cool. So there is one more question uh, from Daniel, which you're going to challenge us. Apparently, there are some clothes for kids with gross wisdom. <laughs> uh, and he came across a company called Petit Pli, which sounds very French. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. What, do you, what do you think about them? Yeah. So um, they are, I think, really interesting. So they're, they're created the fabric. It was um, started by a guy at the Royal College a few years ago who um, it was to do with like the way that they pleated the fabric. It means that when you, I can't remember what the word is, but when you, you know, often fabric stretched one way, but this is pleated in the way so that when you pull it that way, it also expands that way. And there's a particular word for that. He was basically an engineer and looked at like how, uh, yeah, pleats can help things change in directions and was like, oh, I can apply this to clothing. Um, so that it's, so they've created, it's kind of often like sort of t-shirts or quite simple trousers or sort of jumpsuit onesie type things for kids so that when they, as they grow that way, it also expands that way. So I think it's really, really clever because it's trying to create that durability. And so in that case, in that, in that example, the, they use synthetic fabrics to create that effect. Um, but they've obviously considered like, this is supposed to be something that lasts for a long time, grows with this particular child and would be durable enough to be able to use by other children too, which is, so it's, they kind of, it, they've made that trade-off and decision around like which particular fibers they're going to use and how that can be applied. So I think that's, I think it's really, really interesting what they're doing and those kind of models where things can be adapted and evolved, especially for, for kids' clothes where they're, you know, it's definitely going to be having to change all the time. That feels like a really interesting approach. Yeah, definitely they grow out of it before we even think about it <laughs> it's a disaster so it's, yeah it's fascinating i love how innovation can really drive that as well i mentioned that apparently there's a social enterprise doing something similar with shoes yeah i've not heard of that that sounds great yeah so we can uh, definitely we'll put the link as well and, and have a look at that as well later Fantastic. Right. So I guess the final question, if that's okay with me, with you, we always, you know, I'm always really curious about, we, we've got the people in Reading and trying to help them um, making the fashion more sustainable and circular. So what would be your, I guess, top one tips for anyone having an idea in this field or wanting to transition to more circular fashion? Oh, good question. Um, I think the thing I think we're thinking about that's really interesting at the moment, I think, is like what is right for your place. So we, for example, we're doing some work in Leeds recently looking at you know, Leeds is a huge heritage of being like pioneers in textiles. So what could what role could they play as a city in in the next phase? So maybe I think we often we don't often think about like what is what do we have around us as assets in our place? So maybe then in Reading or the area around it, what do you have in terms of the kind of shops you have, the skills you have? How could it work from that kind of place? Um, differently rather than just thinking about how you buy from different brands maybe I think it's something I think is an interesting interesting way of thinking about it. That's really cool. Bring it back to the local one. Fantastic. Well Josie thank you so much for having with you with us today. It was very inspiring. There's so much <laughs> to take out of that. Um, and I know that a number of people had received email that wanted to actually get access to the recording on the back of it as well. So we'll make sure that that is happening. But thank you so much. Thanks on. We've got one more session on fashion uh, next week, and then, as Erica said, we will start a new theme um, coming up uh, very soon around entertainment and regeneration, more around um, uh, making. So, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, and see you all very soon. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye. Bye.